Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Paul said, my name's Gary. I'm the Engagement, Education and Events Officer for the Elan Links Landscape Partnership. Conveniently for me, for me, this paper sort of follows on with a couple of the themes from this morning. It's a landscape scale uh, project. This is centred on the Elam Valley. For those who don't know the Elam Valley, we're in the Cambrian Mountains. It's upland. We're five miles east of the market town of Raida. And it's 1% of Wales. So I'm managing the heritage for 1% of Wales on my own at the moment. Um, 20,000 hectares, which is about 76 square miles. And it's a unique landscape. And I'm going to say it's unique because this landscape isn't marked by a national park or a regional border. It's actually des designated and delegated by the catchment for the reservoirs. So my project stops where Birmingham stops collecting its water. That's what makes it quite unique. And it's known for the extraordinary feat of Victorian engineering. The great dams and the reservoirs which is gravity fed to supply water, Birmingham with a clean source of water, stop them getting cholera and typhoid down there. And that, again, adds to its uniqueness. So since the 19th century, that landscape has primarily been managed with an aim to create a clean water supply. So that means it's avoided a couple of things. It's avoided large-scale cultivation, it's avoided large areas of ploughing, it's avoided large areas of land improvement, added drainage, etc. And it's also is actually quite devoid of those mass conifer plantations, you know, those great big areas of conifer, which we see across much of upland mid Wales. They're absent because that would compromise the, uh, the water supply. The scheme itself, uh, it's a five-year HLF funded £3.5 million project. There's lots of projects. Uh, as all these landscape partnerships, it's a combination of heritage, history, archaeology, oral history, nature, conservation, people, tourism, and networking in partnerships. And the aim is to protect the natural and cultural heritage of the valley, and to boost the opportunity for people to enjoy the area. Very similar to those aims that you see being embedded in national parks. So we're not a national park. We're actually a, a commercial water entity supplying a utility through Welsh Water. 17 different organisations, 26 projects in all, 12 strategic objectives. I'm not going to bore you with all the lists of that because this is an archaeology day. Um, but you can see lots of partners, including CADU, the Royal Commission, CARAD, uh, Local Museum, and increasingly and hopefully more so, going forward into 2023-24, working quite closely with CPAT for some community excavation projects. So what is the heritage of the Elam Valley? We've got 34 listed buildings, 39 scheduled ancient monuments, and over 2,000 records as historic assets. And we know this because part of the scheme was to have a review of the upland surveys. Unfortunately, you can't quite see my pie chart there, but for those prehistorians amongst you, you'll be glad to know that big purple area is the, is the percentage of prehistoric sites that we have in the valley. But they do range, you know, from... Standing stones like that down there at the bottom right-hand corner too. Late 19th century powder magazines, which are still extant and still sitting there in the landscape. So great variety of heritage. And it's heritage at risk. And it's at risk because obviously eventually the landscape will reclaim those assets. Vegetation growth, tree cover, changes it. You can maybe just make out that, that, uh, that building there. Um, a farmstead slowly disappearing under some trees and the bracken and the walls tumbling down. We lose the history and the stories, that oral history, that sense of place, that cultural identity, which all goes hand in hand with these monuments. And then, you know, we can also have threats from future external factors. We don't know 
what may happen in 10, 20, 30 years. Um, a lot of the area is farmed, the 16 farms on the estate, the single farm payments change into sustainable land management or whatever, things will change. So these are all the external threats um, which we needed to try and safeguard from. We are blessed with the Elam Valley. When we come to the later heritage features, those uh, around the great Victorian dams, we do have a fantastic archive. We have a really, really good photographic record. Thanks to the sharp eyes of a lady who worked for Seven Trent in Birmingham who looked out of her office window and saw a large skip being filled with papers, plans, documents and photographs in the 80s. And she took them home and put them in her garage. They now sit in our own designated archive. And these include the water scheme document as signed by Queen Victoria, as presented to the House of Lords. It all went into a skip. So having these fantastic archive photos does allow us to do things like this. This is Cabin Cork Dam, one of the earliest Victorian dams opened in uh, 1903. And I can take it back through archive photographs showing the construction of the dam, showing those great feats of Victorian engineering, 30,000 navvies working on the project. We can go back and we can go right back to where the first steam crane is just being deployed and they're starting to move the stones out the way. They've just put the road in down the right-hand side there. Very, very early days of the scheme. And even beyond that, we can go back to pre-dam which is really useful because when we want to look at the possible archaeology before the dam, we do actually get a photograph of that landscape. We can see possibly the geology, the makeup of the river there. We have been looking at a hospital site which was part of the Navi village, which is on that left-hand bank of the River Elan there. Um, there is some work going on at the moment there, and it's been great to be able to try and understand what was the ground there before they put the terraces in, before they built a large hospital there in the Victorian period. So that's our archive photos. A little bit about the landscape. So seeing we're here in Brecon, great military tradition, I'm just going to talk about some of the military sites maybe at, uh, at Elam Valley. So here we see uh, a nice aerial photograph looking uh, west to east. So Cabin Cork Dam is just beyond that yellow arrow, that flat bit there. That's where we were looking before, looking back this way. But where that yellow arrow is, we want to show you, interesting sight, is this one. And it's the remains of Penigarra Dam. It's a, a, an early Victorian piece of engineering. It was built to create a water supply for the Navi village before the dams. It provided a head of water to give them water for the supply for the village, water to fill the steam cranes, the engines, that sort of thing. So it was redundant once the main dam had been built. However, any of you who might know your World War II history might realise that this dam was actually at scale the same as the dams built in the Rhine, which we bombed during the Second World War. So I can now show you a nice photograph of the very same dam in 1942, Nantigro Dam, so that's the one, July, where Mr Barnes Wallace has had his second attempt at detonating an explosive halfway down the dam. So they didn't bounce the bombs here, they actually strapped them to a piece of scaffolding 40 feet down and, and blew it up. So there's a bit of heritage, a Victorian dam that, you know, was obviously at risk and got blown up by the military. <laughs> Carrying on with that military theme, the Second World War. So above the Royal Tower, there is still remaining three pillboxes. And part of this scheme, the pillboxes, they were cleared of vegetation, they were reconsolidated, the insides were cleaned out, a new footpath was built, a large interpretation board, and Cadu kind of came along and scheduled all three of those uh, as archetypical type um, 52 pillboxes. Inside, they've got the blast walls. On the blast walls, you can still see the newspaper print where they'd used paper to cast the concrete against the bricks inside of the pillbox, so you can learn about the construction. So a great bit of preservation. And it was quite important they did that, simply because when we talk about heritage at risk... 
Here's the site of the other pillbox, the other side of the reservoir, just below what is now a car park. So on the left, in the undergrowth there, you can see some wire cut bricks, some bits of concrete, and on the right, there's a piece of the reinforced concrete roof of the pillbox. Blown up by dynamite in the late 20th century by the water authority to make a car park. There you go, heritage at risk. Hopefully, as legacy, we may actually re put this pillbox back. We'll build a brand new pillbox, as was for 1942, on the site. Complete with a cup of tea still, lukewarm, and, and a brummy home guard asleep in the corner. Another property here, Elan Village. So the great Victorian prison for Elan, for all the drunken navvies, demolished February 2010. Okay, so we do have those two windows. Now, if it still be extant today, we would have had you know, a great attraction. Come and spend the night in a Victorian prison. But uh, demolished, demolished through ignorance, really. It was unsafe, apparently. So they drove a digger into it. So how did we tackle this? Enough of the frivolity. So we, um, we, we commissioned an at-risk register. Commissioned by uh, Trussell, and I'm sure many of you will know Jenny through the research framework for Wales and her, her partner Paul Sandbrook. Um, so they, first of all, they did a, a report, desk-based and also field-based. They looked at all the previous records, all the upland survey records for sites and monuments uh, and heritage assets within the valley, and they went through quite, you know, ridic ri quite... Uh, Tough, really, on some people. <laughs> that's saying, no, no, sorry, that's a piece of bedrock. It's not a Khan. So they threw out all the rubbish. They, they listed what was still left there. And producers with a gazette, a gazette here of sites. That service, it comes off the back of 30 years of upland landscape research. So this isn't new. This has been going on, you know, almost as long as I've been involved in archaeology in so many ways. Initiated by the Royal Commission, but it predates GPS. You know, often some of these sites were recorded on a really dark, wet, windy Friday afternoon in November on a very soggy OS map in pencil in the rain, trying to keep the map from blowing away. And when you actually get up there, you find that it's 20, 30, 40 metres in the wrong place, or it's been recorded twice, or it's not even there now, it's completely disappeared. So there's a bit of a revision exercise, really, um, to just correct those records, and, you know, to get an up-to-date 21st century set of, of inventories um, so that we, you know, as the trust, can have a half-decent stab at managing the, the remaining heritage. So this allowed us to produce a Heritage at Risk register, we prioritised those sites. We discovered that 18 were nationally important, seven are regionally important, 31 are locally important, 14 minor importance, 10 we weren't quite sure. But it gives us, you know, all oh, archaeologists love a good distribution map. There we go. Red, you know, is, is, the, is the, the most important. Right down, green and blue. So you can see they're fairly well spread out across the estate, across those 70-odd square miles. Big area. The records were particularly weak in that bottom right hand corner there, that, uh, that eastern section of the estate, there were quite poor records. We don't know why they were worse than anywhere else, but it, that was identified by the initial survey. So <clears throat> we re recommissioned Trussell to do a second intensive walkover survey. Fortunately, COVID got in the way, but um, you know, they carried on. It was completed in July of this year, so it's, it's hot off the press. It's a 65 square kilometre area. It was resurveyed in detail. And there's just over 700 new sites being recorded, all yet to go in the HER. And the report for that is due at the end of the year. So I'm quite looking forward to uh, getting the details on that. So... It's been a really worthwhile exercise. You know, not only have we recorded the up-to-date data, but we've also found new sites, 
and they've also now got that level of protection. Some will go forward for scheduling, uh, and so hopefully we're, we're meeting our aims as a, a project. So my role, as well as managing the lights of Trussell with that project, I've got another four or five projects which really involve around access to archaeology, interpretation to our, of archaeology, uh, innovation for engagement, particularly with youngsters. And so I've been mapping my project sites out. We've got some excavation candidates. So from that heritage at risk register, we looked at the sites, we looked at the sites, not only on what are, what are their risks, but also what is the practical implication for being able to excavate them. One issue we do have is that about 96% of the Elam Valley is a triple SI and also a, a SAC, especially of conservation. So before we put any trowels in the ground, we do need licensing from Natural Resources Wales. So there's a process. It's a long process in that respect before we can actually go in and do some excavation. But from, all, from those, those initial excavation candidates drawn from that survey, we have highlighted two sites which we hope to work on in the spring of next year. Um, so this one is Cumplow House Platforms. It sits very close to the bottom of Carwen Reservoir. It sits very close to the curtailage of the current farm. We suspect, trust or suspect, they could well be medieval house platforms. There's about three or four of them there have identified. There's a big gap in the research framework for upland or maybe not so quite upland because this is on the edge of the valley medieval settlement. Uh, and there's a, an opportunity there to excavate. It also ticks my, my community boxes because it's close to a large car park where we can park about six or seven coaches and a toilet block. It's visible from the site and we could actually get a wheelchair there. So it makes a really, really nice candidate for uh, community-based excavation. Just to show you, so that's looking down the hill. And you can see that fence line. So interesting, that fence line is also the boundary for the triple SI. So everything that side of the boundary is in the curtailage of the farmyard and hasn't got any designation of protection. And everything this side of that fence is now in the triple SI. That fence runs right through the middle of the house platform. As it would. Couldn't just come a bit further up, could it? But uh, no, it's a, an obstacle we'll get across and you can... See the fence in that right-hand picture there? You can, those of you with a bit of an eye for these things will quite clearly see that house platform there. And that view down the valley, the original track up to there is heading up to Monk's Trod. That's the, the route up to Strata, Florida. I'm not going to spend all afternoon talking about this, the history of this landscape, but I would urge you to look at the CPAC Historic Landscape Study for Elam Valley. It's all there for history. But that's the important link there, is the... Uh, possible monastic connection. Just to highlight those, those platforms there, you see that fence running straight through the middle. So that's one site that we, we intend to investigate in the spring involving local schools as well as volunteers uh, from primary school and then right through to uh, university level. It's a good opportunity. And then the second site, this is another one that, this is, this is interesting, this is, this is one of my projects which has been come up for uh, interpretation, it's also quite, quite high on the Heritage at Risk register. Um, rabbit Warren, Pillow Mounds. I'm sure some of you may have come across some of these before. There's about eight of these mounds. It's sitting up at the northwest corner of the, of the estate. That road is the old Aberystwyth Road. Again, it's connecting through to those main routes down, right down to Strata, Florida. To interpret it, it would be great to get a date. You know, as most people will know, these, these, these pillow mounds, if they are rabbit warrens, they could be mid medieval period. They could be late 1800s. It's a big period for me to try and interpret and tell the story of this site. Unfortunately for the site, but fortunate for me, if you look at that bottom image there, I couldn't so I haven't got any decent aerials yet. I couldn't get a better blow up. That's, that's off Google Earth. There's a house platform which has been dissected in half by that metalled road. 
So the two bits of the remaining bits of the house platform sit north and south of the road. If Paris County Council might decide to come along and do some more work on the drainage or widen the road, we're going to lose what's left of the house platform. So that's where there's an opportunity to, A, it's at risk, let's go and see what we can record, and B, it may well produce some evidence, and we think, we suspect it could well be the Warrener's house. So that's our second site for community excavation next year. Vegetation management, so that's something else we're doing. So we've got a number of these sites, particularly a number of prehistoric sites, which disappear very, very quickly into the bracken and the undergrowth. So again, as part of that survey, we identified some which we thought, you know, really would benefit from some actual land management. And we're going in and cutting the bracken, cutting the gorse away, getting rid of the rushes. So then, A, we can resurvey the monument accurately. We could possibly go and then do some decent geophys where we can get in rather than in amongst the bracken. Um, but it raises all those questions of long-term management. You know, what happens to these sites in next year's time when the project stops and nobody's actually managing it and they're just left to grow? So is it actually worth us actively going out and cutting these sites every couple of years to preserve their, their views? And again, because of the nature of the location of these sites, they're up in the wilds, they're on the top of the hills, very few hill walkers get up to see them anyway. They're quite remote, a lot of them, as much of the, the upland part of the, of the sites are. So it's a question, but there, there's an example. That's one we've already done. So this is a, this is a cyst. You see on the left, you know, again, takes a trained eye to spot it. Well, that's where we've cleared it out. We've got rid of the vegetation, emptied it out. It's there. It can be recorded. It can be photographed. It could be drawn. We get a better record of it. So that's one of the things that we're doing to try and manage the heritage better on the site. I've got my Project 7A interpreting ELAN. So I've got from Cum ELAN lead and zinc mines... Got Nancy Grow, which is the Dambusters uh, Dam. I've got a Roman marching camp. I've got the pillow mounds. Uh, what am I doing at the bottom? Oh, and the pillboxes. I'm going to do some more interpretation of pillboxes, possibly putting one back. That's the idea as a legacy project for that. So engaging youngsters. I'm sure some of you here may have children or grandchildren, or dare I say it, great-grandchildren, who spend most of their waking lives, <laughs> waking lives playing Minecraft. It's now on the curriculum in Wales, fortunately. I've done quite a bit of training with it. Um, we're getting youngsters to come in and create. So what we've done is I've used satellite data, NASA satellite uh, height data, to produce a Minecraft map of the Elan Valley estate. Kids can come in, and in a shared online world, we can rebuild these sites, these heritage sites, looking at archive photographs, looking at plans, recreating them digitally and virtually as a sort of cooperative effort among youngsters. Trick them into learning about archaeology by getting them to play Minecraft. That's, that's the tactic. So we've already, done, we've already done the dam. We've been working on the marching camp. We've also done the, uh, the mine. Um, some of this will go to outreach in Birmingham. So, of course, our project faces towards Birmingham. Quite difficult to reach communities. So this is the sort of thing we'll be offering at uh, the Midlands Arts Centre near Cannon Hill Park next year. In the, in the summer holidays, get youngsters in, come and do Minecraft sessions, learn about the history and heritage of where the water comes from. And I call it education by stealth. I come and play Minecraft. Here's our marching camp. Um, go and stand on the ground, very, very hard to see. If you, if you look, look in the records, you can see a number of CPAC members of staff stood with staff looking around, looking quite... <laughs> Quite perplexed that they can't find it on the on the on the records, but from aerials, you know, it, it's quite it's quite visible. And this leads on to really the other the other side of this project, which is the role of volunteers. But again, just before I get to that, I'm going to start just by showing you this one. So, how do you interpret a marching camp? And it's hard to get to. It's in the middle of nowhere. Nobody really knows much about it. Nobody's going to go up there. But we need to be able to bring that heritage into the classroom, into the museum in Raid, into the visitor's centre. So I'm a great fan of 3D digital game software. So we're using Unity uh, with some 3D renders to create a 3D reproduction. And this is where 
volunteering comes in. Now, I won't embarrass the gentleman, but he's sitting in the audience. There's a gentleman here who flew this site out of it for his own research, with his own drone, created the last cloud survey and kindly passed that on to me. I then just passed that on to my 3D developer. So he's remodeling that Roman marching camp on an actual last cloud reproduction of the landscape. That's coming up, that video, in the new year. So keep an eye on our, on our website for that. So again, that's the role of volunteers. I have another volunteer who spent nearly all of July and August walking every day with his drone and his dog up and down the valley. We have very, very low water levels. So again, he's managed to supply me with, you know, at no cost to the project, aerials of things like Nankwilt House, that's the original house there. That's what remains today. This is the house that Shelley wanted to buy. Fell through. It comes visible once in a while. Provided by volunteers, important element. Here we have the ridge. This is the valley heading back down into, uh, into Raid. Again, a volunteer out with his drone, surveying that cliff face. I'm not going to go and climb down that cliff face looking for sites. I haven't got the time or the resources. He spots, you probably won't see it on this image, of only a couple of little holes, a couple of adits there. Gets in with the, drone, with the drone. We find some late 16th, early 17th century silver workings. Silver from there sent to Aberystwyth for the mint. For Charles I funded the Royalist war effort back to the military thing. Get provided by a volunteer. I'm just going to round up now. I think it's a beautiful image. So right up on the top of a, of a ridge, another, another volunteer out with his drone. It's a long hut with a quite a defined piece of interesting earthworks around it on a, a steep drop down. No date, no record, but he found it. He pointed, as, pointed out to us, pointed out to the archaeologists. So um, that's the role of you know, volunteers and the, the talented and skilled enthusiastic amateur, you know, we often put them to one side, but they can provide a lot. So, within half an hour, thank you. Do follow us on Facebook. <laughs>